listening to the Mark Bradford Alchemy for Life podcast. Does this plague you too? I have a solution. Well, hey there. Welcome back. What's wrong with me? An introduction. My unspoken perception, my first voice, is as follows. I'm not saying this is correct, and in most of this, it certainly is not. But here it is. Let me tell you about a thing. People who have overcome this have always struck me as more adult than me. They seem more mature, more developed, but also perhaps more anal retentive. They overcame it, this thing, probably at an early age. They come from better stock, are more educated, more refined. They were taught this by better parents or at Yale or something. Of course, my interaction with them never proved any of this correct, but I continued to have this inner belief. So then, why didn't I overcome it and strive to be like them? Well, there's a block preventing that. See, if I overcome this thing, two things might happen. One, I will be less me. I'll be giving up parts and pieces that remind me of my humanity, of what it means to be uniquely me. This manifests itself in all the little baubles I hang on to with stuff from my past, pics of the kids, old girlfriends, stuff from projects I worked on, or items that I one day may need. Two, I'll be less laid back, less comfortable, less easy to be around. I'll be more on and professional at all times and would even be uncomfortable when I'm alone because I'll be this new way, meaning if everything's in its place and perfect, then my house is less of a home. I can't relax because everything is pristine like some sort of loner from a movie. Good people you can trust have messes and flaws and are human, right? Those two things are literally the opposite of reality. I've been afraid of tackling this, not just on a case-by-case -case basis, but on the whole, as part of my personality. If I fix this, I'm fixing me in a way that's scary. Because what if it leaves old, lovable Mark behind? I suppose this is an innate fear for anyone wanting to make a big change. We seek out that comfort and want to stay there. But the paradox is that by fixing this, you have more comfort, not less. You have less stress, not more. And you realistically can be more laid back. This is in line with Alchemy for Life, this coaching and podcast I started many years ago. So what is this thing? It's clutter. You might think it's a joke, this anticlimactic answer to what you thought was a mental clickbait. But it's not. It's serious. It's prevalent, lifelong, and it's ingrained in your psyche like a bee sting in your flesh. Any attempts to dig it out fail, and the poison remains forever. So now you know my mental blocks for avoiding it. The clutter isn't so bad. Everyone has a junk drawer, right? So what if there's also a junk closet, a junk pantry, a junk dresser top, a junk office area, a junk floor made of gray clothing, etc.? Just put it away. The problem is that, just like saying no to drugs, there's more to the issue. You can't just put it where it belongs for more than one reason, the most obvious being that it might not actually have a place. This is due to it being new, a one of a kind, or something that you just haven't made space for yet. You may do this because out of sight, out of mind has worked well enough for you, or, and this is self-worth related, you may think you, and therefore it, is not important enough to warrant the time to make a special place for it. Even if you live alone, you still may fear carving out a space just for that stuff. A perfect example is a craft area. Sure, the kitchen gets proper space and the bathroom and all the supplies that go along with those rooms. But a craft room or a work area might feel sort of selfish. And that is exactly what my knee-jerk reaction to some craft rooms has been. When I'd see someone with a really nice craft room and all sorts of organization, I would sometimes just think how selfish they must be to put all that effort into that. Just for themselves. The nerve of them. They should be solving world hunger or making dinner 
not having an epically laid out room with all their tools and stuff at their fingertips. And at the same time, I envied them. But then they were more adult than me. They figured it out. And being in a relationship with someone like that would be scary. Imagine the expectations. This craft area idea also extends to the kitchen and the bathroom and other mundane utilitarian areas. Three reasons for why you create clutter. So, I found there were really three things that generated clutter. In other words, there were three reasons that you would not have everything in its place. Lazy. As you would expect, one reason is that you just fail to do it. You have a place, all neat and tidy, but you just leave it out on the counter or you just shove a bunch of it into a big area. The classic junk drawer. There's no place like home. The second reason is that you actually haven't made a place for it. But why wouldn't you? Number one, because it's a one-off or it's a new thing. You only just started buying, collecting, creating these. It's too new. Two, you didn't think these things needed a place. You could always just throw them in with other stuff, thus creating clutter you have to sort through. And three, I don't know. I mean, I know, but I'm saying he would say, I don't know. You might be unsure of what to do. Do these go near where they're used or do they go in a place that best suits them? Sorting into minutia. Do not take all of this to mean that we're sorting down into infinity. That's not what this is about. A jar of change is perfectly fine. We needn't make a little tray for pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters, half dollars, silver dollars, etc, etc. Yes, sorting is the base of much of this, but it can be taken too far. The difference between non-clutter and clutter is the difference between a tray for pens and pencils and a drawer filled with random office supplies. You don't have to separate the pencils from the pens if you don't want to. And in fact, if you almost never use office supplies, then a drawer full of random office supplies may not even be clutter for you. That may make the average person uncomfortable. But if you're a grandma that has an epic knitting supply, you just might have a teeny drawer with three pens, two pencils, a few binder clips, and a couple paper clips. It's all about what's in sync in your life. Distance and proximity to head. You don't store your forks in the bathroom. You don't keep your socks in the garage. The WD-40 is not in your top dresser drawer. Duh and double duh, right? We know how to store things by room and purpose, mainly, but we run into problems sometimes because of that. We rely too heavily on it and just stop there. As long as all our bedroom crap is in the bedroom, that's enough. And then the clutter occurs. So we separate socks, undies, workout clothing, shirts, etc. Drawer, drawer, drawer. We should put things we use in the most easiest reach and or near our head. Our head is the sensor pod that has the eyes and the ears. We design things so we don't have to go shove our heads into the top shelf for something that we use every day. You're not going to bend all the way down or get on your knees to open a bottom drawer for your daily underwear. You want that right up top. It's that procedure, simply put, that allows us to organize best. And you will find that if you are plagued with clutter, there are a number of areas that you have done exactly the opposite for yourself. And at the same time, it is the keeping important things within reach concept that has allowed you to comfortably forget about everything else until you need something. Then you discover the nest and start complaining to no one and everyone about not being able to find it. Meaningful, purposeful clutter. Let's define the clutter we are not talking about here. We are not talking about what I call meaningful, purposeful clutter. Meaningful in that it has meaning. There's a reason for it. Purposeful in that it has purpose. It is there for a very good reason. Meaningful, purposeful clutter only exists temporarily while the task that creates them is being completed. Examples of this are when you're working in your car and now your garage is taken over with tools and parts. Things are laying all over the garage floor as if the car literally exploded. When you're cooking, there are cooking implements, spoons, ladles, a colander, lying all over the counter. There are mixing bowls, pans, and measuring cups. 
Some are oozing ingredients onto the countertop. There's flour and chopped items everywhere. It's a mess. It's temporary. And it has a purpose and a meaning. In a couple hours, the kitchen will be back to normal. Less perhaps the giant pile of pans in the sink. That, too, is temporary. This is not the clutter we're talking about. We're talking about the one without purpose, without meaning. Well, there is one in a way. And it has permanence. Clutter. Psychological blocks. Clearly, there is something that prevents us from just having meaningful clutter. Something is causing us to have the clutter that haunts us, annoys us, and plagues us. It's something beyond just being lazy or messy or disorganized or not having the time. Spoiler, it's psychological. What follows is an introspective examination of why it affected me. And you may relate to this. You're not decluttering if you are doing this. If you are moving things to another place slash room that just clutters that up, and it isn't the actual place it belongs, then you're just adding to clutter to declutter, and that's not decluttering. That's exactly what created clutter in the first place. The uncertainty of narrowing it down and just dumping it into an area. Overwhelmed by the task. So, you start decluttering and sorting in good faith and start to create piles of things and then you stop. You're overwhelmed. You start running into the other room or reading old books, looking at old pictures, find interest in something you haven't looked at in a decade. Oh, and you should continue this after you eat. Yeah, low blood sugar and all that. You're overwhelmed. Decluttering is overwhelming because you get to a point of permutation that you can't hold in your brain's workspace processing area. Let me explain. When you take something out that doesn't belong and think there may have to be a new place for that, there are really only three options. But when you take out more things, that there are three options, and so forth and so forth, this starts multiplying. This goes here, but oh, I don't have space, and is this the thing like this thing, and how many of these do I even have? Oh, I can't throw all of this out. Dang, I wish my house would just burn down and I could start from scratch. Don't wish for a house fire. The solution is easy. And thus ends part one of the special decluttering series. I hope this made a lot of sense to you. I hope this sort of touched you in a way that you went, oh, I'm not alone on this, and I'm not crazy, and I'm not lazy that this really is an overwhelming thing. Part two of this not only contains the solution, but it contains a couple PDFs that basically act as a checklist and a roadmap to ending clutter. The cool thing about that is that it kind of takes all the emotion out. It allows you to just basically follow a, a flow chart that says, oh, okay, now I know what to do with this versus being sucked in and immersed in nostalgia, guilt, and so forth. This just allows you to process and get through it. If you're listening to this as a subscriber, there's nothing you have to do. You'll be sent the PDF along with the podcast. If you're not a subscriber, please do subscribe. Then you'll automatically get that. And thank you for listening. Thank you for allowing me to go over my time. And I will see you next week and we'll get this done for you. Take care. Hey there, thanks for listening. You know I always appreciate your feedback. Please keep it coming. Three Voices is out. It's a fun read and only $9.99 US on Amazon. And as of this recording, it reached number three in experimental psychology. So thank you so much.